how to be secure in Christ, and the aspects that uh, I chose in terms of how security in Christ in terms of the psychological perspective is from attachment theory. So those of you who have been, you know, heard me before, you've heard it several times. The reason why I do that is because, um, you know, it, it needs time to marinate in terms of new concepts and um, things that we, we haven't heard before. It's helpful to hear several times. That's why, you know, Paul goes, you know, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. And different times it says, I don't mind repeating myself because he knows how we are, uh, human nature, we tend to forget. But the more you remind it, the more you can really um, habituate yourself into these concepts and this theory, which I think will be really helpful for you. Okay, so let's go to Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 21. So um, the focus verse in this passage is being rooted and established in love. Um, hence this image. Recording in progress. And so, oh, you know, and this is key in, in the whole attachment process. It helps you to be rooted. And, um, but specifically, when you are rooted and established in love, that's when you can grasp. And I think this really speaks to attachment theory, because when you have a secure base, it says that you have room to explore. So it really matches and mirrors the scripture really well. So um, now I want to go briefly into attachment theory and where it came from. But I'm not going to go into the whole aspect of insecure attachments. Um, some of you may know about, my, you know, the, the three other insecure attachment styles. I really want to focus more on secure attachment, especially since we do have a time limit today. Uh, the image over here, it's almost as if it's a mirroring process, which I'll explain to you later on, when we're able to mirror and even grasp the thoughts of the other. It is an amazing, um, it's, it's an amazing tool to, to help others feel connected and you connected to others. But the original people who, who came up with this was, um, first of all, Bowlby. And he uh, was, was a psychiatrist. And, you know, the, the thinking at, during that time was dependency was a negative thing, to be dependent on someone else. It's always a strive for independence. That thinking can still be here today, that if you are completely independent, then you are a truly fully functioning human being. But he observed that, no, actually, uh, we're actually a lot more interdependent, and that's a lot more healthy. And people mocked him for it. They're like, ah, oh, you, you're calling human beings to regress. And he said, no, it's actually based on my observation between um, parents and their children. So he noticed that, um, when, when children are just dropped off in hospital, because back then they used to just drop you off at hospital and six weeks later pick you up when you're better. And so he noticed that th there was a whole, um, what he would call an at attachment process that he noticed that there would be protest, there would be despair, there would be dis dismissiveness towards the parents because they did not know how to react towards this person who is supposed to be a secure person but now drop them in the middle of nowhere and then suddenly reappears. And so Ainsworth took this a little bit further. Um, but before I go into Ainsworth, let me stay with Bowlby. He came up with really important concepts, which, which, which is the secure base, proximity, um, basically safety and protection. So uh, you believe that you can access someone else and feel safe, that is important. And then what is called internal working models. These internal working models, uh, I'll explain a bit later, it's coming up, my, my mind is a little bit ahead of me. And then Ainsworth came up with the attachment styles. So now, starting with the secure base, um, I love rock climbing, so hence that image of a rock climber. You, you know, when you're climbing, you've got to trust your belayer, who's going to hold you if you fall. The inherently, if they don't know what they're doing at the bottom and you fall, you're dead. So the secure base is someone that you feel that you have an absolute trust in. And this then allows you to explore the world. You know, you have confidence that the primary attachments will still be there when they return. 
and you're able to receive comfort and care without anxiety or guilt. So some of you are thinking, well, if you don't have these feelings, it means that you haven't developed a secure base. And it's something for you to really reflect on. Um, or your, your base hasn't been consolidated and you still need to grow a little bit more in, in the aspect of a secure base. To recent research, we call um, the person the primary caregiver because there's so much research um, that, you know, because traditionally it was mostly mothers who, who cared for the infants and children. And because the society is changing and the world, they're finding that as long as it's a primary consistent other, um, that, uh, and, and that consistent other is important <laughs> because how that person responds to you it becomes the model of relating to other people. So, and that is what we go into next. He came up with something called the internal working model. Um, it's basically patterns of relating to the other. Something you have picked up in terms of if I react this way, this is how this person's most likely going to respond. That assumption of how the other person um, responds is really from how you were treated as a child. And so, you know, I drew, <laughs> I couldn't find my, a proper image, so I did my own little random image here. That is my childlike drawing of a model. So the blue section, so your internal wor working model, I, it's, an abstract, it's an abstract concept. And so that's the only way to um, concretize the internal thought. I thought, okay, let's, let's try, and, try and express it this way. So the blue section, storied memories of day-to-day -day interactions. You know, when we're interacting with each other, we're actually observing people's responses, not consciously, quite unconsciously, and then we store them in our minds. The more consistent the response of the other, neurologically, the easier it gets for you to get to that particular thought. So for example, if you had a, a primary caregiver that was you know, accessible, responsive, and engaging, and was really mirroring you, and accurately named your emotions, and was able to express your internal self, then you trust that the other person will always remain that way. And so when others in the future interact with you, you tend to have a confirmation of, oh, this is how people feel about me, and this is how then I can respond towards others. So then the green aspects are, the green, which is this left one, it's not very green, I notice now, but um, it's the expectations and associative affective associated affective responses. So basically, if, I res if someone responds to me well, I feel like if someone gets you, how do you feel? Comforted, Comforted great, what else? Safe. Safe, absolutely. If someone um, does not seem to get what you're trying to express, what are the feelings that usually come up, you come up with? Frustration, insecurity, insecurity. You, shut down. you shut down. Yeah, can you see how, and, and if you consistently have that, for example, then you s will start believing that I am unknowable. Mm. No one can know me. It's too difficult. I'm too difficult for anyone to get. And so then you, you have this model then of go go relating in the world that no one will ever get me then you can see how this will then affect your relationship with God. Does God really get me? And, and so that's why attachment theory can really help us to understand how can I develop a better relationship with God and be less frustrating in your journey towards um, you know, a deeper, more connected relationship. So now the yellow section, it's your guiding actions based on previous <laughs> interactions. So we anticipate the response of the other. So, um, so basically, if you are with someone you feel safe with, how do you tend to act? Yourself. And what's yourself? Mm. The congruence, yes. 
and without refrain. I love it. You, you, there's such a freedom to, to being yourself. Okay, so then the red section is your accumulated schemas and scripts. We know them as life traps. And so there's, um, these patterns of interactions become your core belief about, uh, and your internal core belief about yourself and about others. And so all of these things interact together. It's not like they're all separate parts. And it's amazing, it's, it's just, it's instantaneous. I'm just unpacking what goes into your one interaction. But that one interaction is accumulated memories and experiences over years will then lead to why you say what you say in that moment or why you feel what you feel in that moment. I mean, that's quite something. So then you know that if you have a wonky model then you have a problem. You know, the picture on the left, there's one where the, the, the yellow section where you actually see yourself accurately. And then the other picture, you can see there's a distorted version of self. That if you don't have a healthy internal working model, you will have a distorted sense of self and the world and how it looks like. And so that's why you know, sometimes if you're having difficulty with understanding God or feeling connected to God, it's not necessarily a God thing. It's because of your accumulated experiences over time, specifically from your childhood. There is hope, though. So it doesn't mean that because your internal working model that was consolidated before the age of five, it's fixed, that you can no longer shift that internal working model. That is not true. In recent research, you find that you know, the, the brain is neuroplastic, meaning that it, there are constantly neurons and interactions that can create new neural pathways that never existed before. And that is amazing. So when, when you would have an instant reaction towards one response, when you have more corrective experiences, you can actually shift over to a new neural network that can help you to have a, you know, um, you know, work towards a secure base and a healthy, secure attachment. So that's the hopeful aspect. So what does a secure attachment look like? Um, that means you're comfortable in a loving and emotionally close relationship pattern. You know that when, you, when a person gets too close to you and you start to panic, that usually means you don't have a secure attachment because if a person's too close and you start feeling vulnerable, right, and you think, uh-oh, if it is an, uh, an insecure attachment, your response is, this person's going to hurt me. So let me keep a healthy distance. And this might even translate in your relationship with God. When you feel like you're too comfortable with God, you're expecting He's going to strike me down the next moment. I'm just waiting to step in that sin because it's too good. <laughs> you know? it's, it's, it's really too good. I don't know if you've ever felt that way before or experienced that. Or we, we, we can think, no, this, this, this can't be right. That's because you haven't had enough experiences of it always going right. God always intended for it to go right from the beginning. He always wanted us to have a healthy attachment to him and to one another. And that, you know, that was destroyed at the fall. And so we're trying to pick up the pieces here in terms of how do we try and rebuild that or, um, you know, reestablish that. Psychology is a useful tool. Uh, always look at it that way. However, ultimately it is God's restoration of who we are to who we should be is, is, is the ultimate goal. So, you know, a secure attachment also is about being able to open up and you're available to others more often than not. Because if you're secure, you don't fear judgment. <laughs> so you don't even expect judgment. So it will help you to just open up. Y it's your, if, if you need to confess your sin, you don't expect you know, thunderbolts. You just expect an opportunity to change. And it really is, is helpful when you have a secure attachment. 
and then you become more available to others. That you're not thinking about, how am I appearing before this person? You, there's more room for you to actually listen to the other. I know that, you know, um, Anne-Marie was talking about being able to listen, slow to be quick to listen, slow to speak. You can't be quick to listen if your own thoughts are about, oh my goodness, I better do the right thing, I better say the right thing, how am I appearing now? Your mind's too busy, but that actually can come from an insecure attachment where and you're lacking a secure base within yourself. And then uh, the next thing is about being able to communicate your needs and emotions easily and openly. I mean, that's amazing. When you express <laughs> what you need and you don't expect disappointment. Because that's what we generally do feel, is if I express my needs, it's most likely not going to be uh, met. A someone who is securely attached does not think that, generally. Most of the time, okay. Um, because, and if they do experience something that is, uh, you know, not to the norm, they're able to correct themselves back again quite easily. And then you, you don't see the need to avoid conflict and is confident in addressing disagreements or hurts. Wouldn't it be amazing to be this kind of person? You're like, okay, and this really represents who Jesus is. Uh, he is, he's, he doesn't avoid conflict, he can address disagreements quite easily, can, can hold the hurts of others, generally tr trusting and tolerance of differences in opinion and perspective. And this basically is a description of who Jesus is. And we can see from his relationship with God, he was clearly securely attached. Because he, he saw God as accessible, responsive and relying, uh, reliable and engaging. And that was his, his model. His internal working model was, this is who God is. And that's why you can call him Father. Because that is the intimacy that he wants. That he brings you into family. And so, you know, s someone who's securely attached can be both close and independent. That's why you don't see any codependence. I exist because you exist. No. Um, that, that there is an, it's, it's an ability to connect and then be okay by yourself. So that's what a secure attachment is, looks like. Are we good? Yes. Any questions? Great. So I keep saying this, but then what can develop the secure attachments? In recent, recent research, there's so much. Um, I just thought just to consolidate it into a small section is are you, if, if, you're, if you become accessible, responsive, and engaging, are you there? In other words, do you see me and do you exist? And so I love the fact that God says, I am. He's like, I exist. I never had an inception point and I don't have an end point. I just am. You can't be more securely attached than any other person outside of God. And so that's why we have the privilege of bec becoming securely attached because if you can Get, have these experiences of God where he is accessible, where you find him accessible, where you have memories and experiences of him responding to you, and you know he's engaged with you. You know there's those silent prayers, and you know no one know, else knows them. But man, it was answered. Those are important memories to hold on to that can help you to remember that God is present. So if anything in your, in your own mind training is remember those experiences with God. Those are the memory stones you build in your mind that can help you through the storms and help you to see you are, you, you are cherished by the I am. Okay. Um, and then we can try and to be this way with others, you know. Because if you're the type of person where you're always busy and no one can <laughs> reach you, you're too busy. Because that, then you're telling people, I'm not accessible. And you, you know, you've been chosen because there is a belief that you're the future leaders. 
and you are going to, um, I don't know what leadership capacity you will be in, but it will be leadership. And so this becomes key because you can be used as a tool once you figure it out yourself, number one, um, but for others as well. It's amazing when you go to a leader and you know that they're accessible. <laughs> you can speak to them. It makes such a difference to you, right? You are going to be called to be the same for others in the next generation. I, I know that I have my five-year-old son and he's going to look to you as an example and he's going to want to access you and may you be accessible to others and responsive, um, not not being quick to judge or, or make, um, make you know, rash conclusions. That's a responsive person, re it requires you to be curious a little bit more before you, and ask a lot more questions before you come to a final conclusion. And then engaging as in you will do something about it. It's not just listening to the person and affirming them, it's about, okay, what can we do about it and how can we do it together? And isn't that amazing when you come with something, it's a real strain and concern, and then someone says to you, let's go together. And let's do it together. Not, no, I'll give you the tools and you sense off. It's such a different experience when they're saying, oh, I can see you're really struggling with this. Um, you know what, the only way it's gonna be helpful is if I walk with you. What a relief that you, d that you can feel that you don't have to bear it all on your own, that there is an accessible other to, to do life with or to do ministry with is amazing. I'm looking at the time, I'm like, ah! Okay, so now further on in terms of developing a secure attachment with God, if we go to Matthew 25, isn't it intense that when we have this perspective of who God is, this is how we will respond? Um, it's, it's, we cannot respond any other way. We sometimes think we will never be this, this man, and it's like, uh, if you have a perspective of God being a hard man, being unjust, um, being, you know, having high expectations, and also almost like a slave driver, you know, gathering where you have not, e you haven't even done it yourself, so not even accessible. Uh, I'm made to do all of this work alone, and you come in and what, save the world? <laughs> so uh, that doesn't seem fair. And so he decides, well, I'm gonna do at least the bare minimum to get by, to, to make sure that I am not going to face the wrath of God that is a clear example of an insecure attachment before God. It's interesting he doesn't, he doesn't see the need to change his perspective. God's clearly very secure. <laughs> he can take someone else's perception of who he is, and he's like, okay. And then he works with it. He's like, well, you could have put it in a bank. And he's not a, you know, and I think that astounds me. Where, where, you know, God's response. But he does also, you know, he does say, you wicked and lazy servants. I'm like, woo, that's, that seems harsh. Wicked, like it almost seems to confirm this person's belief of who he thinks God is. So it doesn't matter if you have a certain belief system, no matter what anyone says, it's going to confirm your belief is called confirmation bias. You just can't help but keep getting the same message over and over again. You dismiss the aspect where others were able to use the same talents and multiply it. Never mind how they were able to do that themselves and to varying degrees. We tend to look then, if you, s if you see God in this way, in terms of our own personal experiences and we tend to then dismiss what the, the full picture of things. Because if we had to just look at this you know, small subset of who God is, if this is the only explanation you think of who God is, you're in trouble. And so that's why it's important, you know, someone who's securely attached, remember they have a secure base, so they're willing to explore. They're like, okay, let me explore further. Let me explore this God a little bit more without fear. So 
um, observe. So that's why you need to see how you tend to respond to God when you face adversity. That will help you to see how you really see God. Now, not out of, don't be punitive about it. Just observe yourself and then be curious, what makes me respond this way? Because I clearly then don't trust God. And how can I have a corrective experience with God? So once you're aware of that, which scriptures um, can you think of that confirm or deny your perception? Um, in CBT, it's called cognitive rescripting. So then you can look up different scriptures and think, okay, this is what I think of God, but what does God say about himself? And then do I trust <laughs> who God says he is? Because that's the act of faith. And, and, that, and that act of faith will open the door to the corrective experience when you're willing to try something new. That's why faith is vital. You know, without faith, you cannot please God, as it says in Hebrews. Why? Because if you don't have that faith, you won't choose something different in your mind, which then you won't have a different experience of who God is, and you won't be able to do what God desires of you to do. You'll continue to be in your shell. And that is not what God calls us to. So then um, the third aspect is as a community, and this is a question to you, how can we provide corrective experiences for one another? Thank <laughs> you.